You're listening to the DolphinsTalk.com Podcast Network. Welcome to Dolphins Talk Weekly, your one-stop audio breakdown of all of this week's Miami Dolphins news. Now, here is your host, Kevin Dirt. This episode of Dolphins Talk is brought to you by Kingswear. Kingswear is the place to go for officially licensed apparel for the Miami Dolphins, Miami Heat, the Miami Hurricanes, Florida Panthers, and all of the professional and college teams in South Florida. Looking for the latest jersey, a birthday gift, or the newest hat to hit the market of your favorite South Florida team? Check out Kingswear for their overwhelming selection of sports apparel. Located at 2655 South University Drive in Davie, Florida, Canesware has it all. Not in South Florida? No worries. Visit Canesware.com to shop their inventory from the comfort of your home and they'll ship to you. International fans too. Canesware.com is the spot that Miami fans shop. That's Canesware.com. Canesware.com. And welcome, Dolphins fans, into another episode of Dolphins Talk Weekly. I know it's been several weeks since I've had an episode, and even longer since Evan and I have collaborated on a show. But given that we are now officially less than a week away from the start of 2024 training camp, I wanted to come to you guys with a new episode to kind of get us into gear for the preseason in the regular season, and as you can hear, uh, my co-host in the background, Chloe, is very excited for both of those. Uh, for those that are new to the show or don't remember, Chloe is my 65-pound pit lab that thinks she's a lap dog, and she is mad that she is not down here in the studio right now. Uh, with that being said, I believe Evan and I are going to try and get a joint episode out next week on the eve of actual training camp. We'll hopefully record Monday or Tuesday night and have that out for you and then i'll have an episode out after each of the preseason games or if anything major breaks within training camp um i know quite a few people that will be attending some of the practices this year so interested to see some of the news and nuggets that we get uh in the coming weeks so for this week's episode going to basically do a run through of my 53 man roster prediction i think we kind of dove into this back after the draft and having given it some further thought watched some more tape on the free agents and the draft ease themselves i've sort of narrowed down the players that i would consider locks for the 53-man roster and we'll go through some of the position battles and round out my predicted 53 as we are now six days away when you hear this from training camp Uh, but first things first a new episode of Dolphins Talk Weekly calls for a new whiskey that has never been on the show before, but if I'm a betting man, I would wager that I would say at least three quarters of the listening audience has had this one before. Um, And shout out to my brother-in-law for leaving half a bottle of this at my house after a 4th of July party, but we've got just good old traditional quintessential Buffalo Trace bourbon tonight. A little rock in the glass, too. Just feeling a little fancy here on a Wednesday. Just a nice, smooth, easy, oaky, sipping bourbon. Uh, Nothing too fancy about it. Nice, easy drinker in the summer. 3.75 out of 5. You know, I'm not the biggest bourbon fan in the world. And not too complex there, but just a good drink overall. So... Josh, you know who you are. That one's for you. So we will dive into some news real quick. Um, or I guess not news, but rather non-news uh, regarding Tua Tungvalu and the contract situation. And I'll just give a quick take, maybe two takes on this. So number one, and I'll hat tip to Chris Kaufman of the Three Yards Per Carry crew because he tweeted this out. I had not seen this segment, but he tweeted out or retweeted out Ian Rappaport's segment on one of the NFL Network shows. I don't even know what their lineup is. I saw they're bringing back Good Morning Football. Um, I'm not sure why that show kind of lost its value after Kay Adams and Nate Burleson left. But anyway, 
um, Ian Rappaport was on there talking about Tua and the situation with the Dolphins and athletes first and saying that you know there's a deal to be done and they want to do it. Both sides are open to it. They've been negotiating. They've exchanged proposals. And the word that Chris Kaufman used to describe Ian Rappaport's mood was sanguine. And I think that's a pretty appropriate adjective. You know, all off-season long, all summer long, my best sources on this have basically said it's going to happen. I talked about this on the last episode I recorded. I think the main issue is just kind of the structure of the deal. Not necessarily the guaranteed money, but how you structure some of these exit ramps. And we talked about some of those scenarios where, you know, what happens if... You know, for example, the Dolphins do poorly this year. Is there anyone really on the chopping block? If anybody, it's probably Chris Greer because he's going on his ninth season without any kind of tangible evidence of success. But if he goes and you don't have success after that, is Mike McDaniel the next guy in line? What would Tua look like without Mike McDaniel? So those are some of the, the factors and I guess potential risks you could be looking at down the road if you don't structure the contract right. Now, let's be clear. I 100% fully support Tua getting this extension and getting getting whatever the market price dictates, whether he's the new highest paid quarterback in the league for X number of months or a, a year until it ends up being like Dak Prescott or Jordan Love or someone else. I'm for it. He's shown that he can play at an elite level. He's shown that the Dolphins can win with him. I I went over some of the concerns we had, especially about the road games. But it's not all on Tua. And I think this will get done. I don't really care whether it gets done before camp or during camp. Or if people remember a couple years ago, Joe Burrows got done like... September 7th. I don't remember if that was before or after the week one game, but obviously right around it. I don't think the timeline matters so long as Tua is actually there participating and doing stuff in team drills. You know, I think quarterback's kind of the one piece where you need to have your guy in the team drills. Um, You know, a, a reference there to Christian Wilkins sort of hold in last year where. He did everything in training camp. He did individuals. He did seven-on-seven. He did half-line. He just didn't do 11-on-11 stuff. But you can kind of get by with an individual at another position anywhere else on the field other than quarterback because there's multiple guys at those spots. I do think, like, the fan reaction and the vitriol about, you know, why isn't this done... It's just propagated by the content created by ESPN and the mainstream media and people that have had narratives about Tua stemming back to, like, the Brian Flores era and wanting to be seen to be right. Like, I don't think it matters. I think if there is a holdup financially, and again, hat tip to Chris Kaufman for pointing this out, the Goff and Lawrence deals got done before... The NFL got sued in the Sunday ticket thing, and they're on the hook for like $4 billion, possibly more. Those deals got done before that. $4 billion is a pretty sizable chunk of change. You know, that's the net worth of some of the NFL owners. Um, it's more than the net worth of quite a few of the NFL owners uh, or team valuations. So that's a pretty penny that they're having to, you know, go to court for and I'm not saying that that's throwing a wrench into things. You know, Stephen Ross has plenty of money and he has plenty of revenue streams coming in from things outside of the Miami Dolphins and Hard Rock Stadium and Copa America and the Orange Bowl and Formula One and the Miami Open. He's got money coming in from all of that. Plus, he has his own real estate companies and and everything he's doing in, you know... I forget the name of the thing, but the big development he has in New York City. So I don't think Stephen Ross is hurting for cash to the point where that's the holdup with Tua. But it's something to remember in terms of overall like NFL valuations and how things could be seen from a salary cap perspective moving forward. So 
maybe in terms of structuring that money or cash layout, Brandon Shore has to be a little bit more cautious, at least until that is resolved. But I think the, the sort of backbiting and consternation from the fans, it's mostly driven by the media and the fact that we're sitting here in the doldrums of the summer until camp starts. Um, but it's going to get done. Just be patient with these things. They just have to work themselves out. On top of that, you know we know there's interest in Tyree Kill and redoing his deal. And I have heard from multiple people now that the Dolphins have at least have had exploratory talks with an extension for linebacker David Long. Um, if you haven't checked it out yet, there's a great piece by Tyler Dunn from the Go Long platform. You know, no pun intended about David Long and his upbringing in Cincinnati and Dayton, Ohio. Uh, grew up in a pretty rough area of Dayton. Um, they mentioned Salem Avenue. I've driven past that quite a few times as a UD grad myself going into downtown Dayton. And the school that David is from, not in the greatest area, or the high school, I should say, not in the greatest area of Cincinnati, but what has produced. Uh, multiple NFL players and even more will be coming down the pipeline pretty soon. Uh, Mike Edwards, probably the main one who's won two Super Bowls now, but he and David Long, I think there's one more in the league now who I can't remember who it is. It's a linebacker. Anyway, rough area. Great story about David Long. And they mentioned in the article, David Long is going to be the new green dot guy on defense. So that's your leader. And there's a good tidbit at the end in the article about how Long wants to assume that responsibility and be that guy. So if you're looking for the next contract on the horizon that isn't Tua, my money would be on David Long, and I think they'll probably have talks with Javon Holland um, you know, mid-season or during the season, kind of the way they did with Robert Hunt, and let that market play out. So speaking of all these guys, this is the meat of the show now, as we'll quickly have another sip of our Buffalo Trace before we dive in, but I wanted to talk about kind of the roster and going through it, and I figured the easiest way to do it is kind of go position by position, and I've broken them down into really kind of four categories, and I'll name my 53, but going into this, I've got 37 guys I would consider ironclad locks to make the 53-man roster. I've got nine guys who I would consider probable, as in, you know, it's probably taking catastrophic play or catastrophic injury to prevent them from being on the roster. Seven guys who I think are going to win some of the battles in camp. And by battles, I mean sort of like last roster spot at that position group, not necessarily like the starting right guard battle. And we'll go into that. And then have a couple names who I think are guys that you would really want to have on the practice squad for various reasons. So let's dive into it. So at quarterback, I've only got one name as a lock, and that's Oos, number one, Tua Tungavailoa. Don't really need to say anything more. Like He's been Miami's guy since Mike McDaniel showed up. Uh, He's produced at a very high level, led the league last year in passing yards. Uh, I think he was top five in touchdown passes. You know, he's he's the guy. And if you've listened to players talk this offseason, whether it's been Calais Campbell, whether it's been Tyreek Hill, Teron Armstead, who was on the Russ Tucker or Ross Tucker podcast, he was on the K Adams Up and Adams show. They've all basically said it. Two is the guy. He's the integral part of the team. He's going to take them wherever they're going to go. You know, pay the guy. And in my mind, when you have veterans on both sides of the ball kind of speaking up on your behalf, that's how you kind of know you've made it in this league. The old heads know who's real and who's not. Um, So Tua, the one lock at quarterback. I've got four locks in the running back room. Uh, Raheem Mostert, who had a phenomenal season last year. Devon Achan, again, a phenomenal season, although he missed, what, six games and most and only had like f- three touches in another, the week two game against New England. Rookie running back Jalen Wright. 
and then Alec Ingold as the fullback. I think those four guys make it. Ingold obviously playing on an extension. You know, Mostert, they reworked his deal to give him more guaranteed dollars this year. And then A-Chan and Wright on rookie contracts. Those guys figure to be kind of your 1A, 1B, you know, moving forward after 2024. Um, Really like a lot of the talent that they bring in that room. And I'm especially intrigued by some of the new roles that they've given to Devon A-Chan, you know. If you think back to last year, the Giants game, especially how they lined him up at receiver a lot and still found ways to get him the ball on run plays, I think we'll see more of that. And then I think we'll also see more ways to get him the ball in space, whether he's lined up as a receiver, whether he's in the slot, whether it's some sort of gimmick formation. Keep your eyes on 28. The wide receiver room, I've got four locks, and I think one of them may surprise you. The first three obvious Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddell, who just got a well-deserved extension, Odell Beckham Jr., and the fourth one is Braxton Berrios, more for contractual reasons. Uh, You can actually save a lot of money, more money, in fact, if you trade him as opposed to cutting him. Um, And I think with the new kickoff rules, you're going to give him first crack at it, probably, just so you don't burn up like a Devon Achan, for example, though I think it'd be pretty beneficial if you found some of those other guys who could do it. Um... Those are the four guys I think make the roster, you know, walking into camp. Tight end, I've got two locks, Durham Smythe, Johnny Smith, you know, both playing on extensions, and Smith got a new deal. I think you have in Durham Smythe a good blocking tight end who can do a lot of the inline stuff. Johnny Smith gives you more options in terms of 12 personnel. You can do, you know, if you think back to how they ran some of the formations, they were kind of sort of using Alec Ingold as sort of an H-back, you know, offline, tight end, tight to the ball. Now you have a guy in Johnny Smith who can do that and doesn't, you know, give you a tell or give away a tell to the defense about what you're trying to do offensively. Uh, I broke the offensive line down into guard, tackle, center, so tackle, three locks, Teron Armstead, Austin Jackson, Patrick Paul, who they spent a second round pick on. Offensive guard, Isaiah Wynn and Jack Driscoll are my two picks. And then offensive center, Aaron Brewer. And then I'm going to put Liam Eichenberg there just because we know he was the backup last year. But I think he and Jack Driscoll are kind of squared up to battle it out at right guard. I think the athleticism that Jack Driscoll shows at least on the film when you watch him from Philly, is kind of the trait that I want to see the most of. Because you look at the run game last year for Miami when Robert Hunt was missing. You know, they had Robert Jones. They had Lester Cotton. Liam Eikenberg got one game there against Washington. I think Jones did okay when the assignment is, you know, blocking for a play to his side, whether he's got to cut off a one or go up to the second level and reach a linebacker that's coming from the backside, or if he's got a cross face, a three technique, who's on his outside shoulder. I think he can do a lot of that stuff when he's at the point. It's when the plays go to the other side where he's got to cut off a backside linebacker or cut off some sort of box safety where he's got to get to a landmark that he just couldn't do. And you know, I think Liam Eikenberg was a little better in terms of getting to landmarks and moving in space and the, the limited opportunities we've seen at right guard. But if you watch what Jack Driscoll did in Philly, you just see that it's it's better. It's quicker. It's more crisp. The, there's no wasted movement. You're not getting rerouted. You're not getting knocked off your feet as easily. I just think Jack Driscoll has enough to win that right guard battle so moving to the defensive side of the ball we'll go with the d tackle room first three locks there uh calais campbell obviously they just signed him zach sealer who's playing on an extension and then the third guy is a little bit of a surprise that's neville gallimore whose contract is fully guaranteed that's essentially the dolphins saying like hey you're on the hook. You know, if you if we cut you, Stephen Ross is going to ask us questions. You know, why'd you give away $2 million worth of my money, essentially? So 
I think Gallimore's here to play, and we talked about some of the versatility where you've got Calais Campbell as a guy who can play anywhere from like one technique out to nine, and he's done so at various points of his career, including last year with Atlanta. Sealer, I think, is a guy they're pretty comfortable with playing two eye out to like four, maybe some five. Um, but I think there's a reason they went out and got Calais Campbell after seeing Sealer kind of play some defensive end in a four man front in OTAs and mini camp. Um, he's more valuable, tighter to the ball. And then you've got Neville Gallimore, who's played kind of anywhere from a zero technique to a four in Dallas. So he's giving you some technique flexibility up front edge guys i've got four there's a caveat on two when you probably already know bradley chubb jalen phillips with the injuries i think phillips probably has the better chance to be back by week one than chubb but i think if all things equal if they were healthy those guys would be on the roster obviously shaq barrett and chop robinson are the other two locks I think that's probably your top three, just kind of based on the intel I have, would be Phillips, Barrett, and Robinson. At off-ball linebacker, I've got three locks, David Long Jr., Jordan Brooks, and Anthony Walker Jr. Kind of self-explanatory there. You know, you have David Long, who's going to be sort of the three-down green dot guy. We talked about how he's sort of, if you watch Baltimore's defense a year ago, he's Roquan Smith in the run game. And then he turns into what they did with Patrick Queen in the pass game. Jordan Brooks is kind of the opposite. He's more Patrick Queen in the run game and then Roquan Smith in the pass game. And I think Anthony Walker, you know, gives you solid depth. And then you can use him, you know, situationally as it calls, you know, to be a good coverage linebacker for you if you need, you know, more beef on a, a third and short or fourth and short or a, a goal to go run situation. So those three are my locks there. At corner, I've got four, and one of them would be kind of my flimsy lock uh, of this 37 players. Jalen Ramsey, Kendall Fuller, Cam Smith, and then Cater Kohu's the flimsy lock. Um, I do wonder what their intentions are with him and how he can play slot in this defense or if it's more beneficial for you to move Jalen Ramsey into the slot situationally and then bring Cam Smith to play on the outside, whether it's field, boundary, cover one, cover three, whatever. I think Cam Smith can do all of that. Safeties, I've got two, and I think this would be my other flimsy lock if they didn't have basically nothing behind it. Javon Holland, obviously, you know, going to be well motivated to earn an extension whether it's from the Dolphins or a new deal from someone else he should play really well this year Jordan Poyer is just a eh, smart player um, losing a step I do really wonder what happens to the Dolphins if you end up playing Javon Holland closer to the box and you've got to rely on Poyer and or Marcus May to be the deep guys or guy you might have some issues if your corners, you know, aren't on their game. But I think Poyer makes it. And I think the three special teams specialists make it. And that's Jason Sanders, Jake Bailey, uh, Blake Ferguson. So that's the 37 locks right there. So just recapping them real quick. Two at quarterback. That's one. Four at running back, Mostert, Achan, Wright, and then Ingold is my fullback. Four at receiver, Hill, Waddle, Beckham Jr., and Berrios. Tight end, Smythe and Smith. Offensive tackle, Armstead, Jackson, and Paul. Guard, Wynn and Driscoll. Center, Brewer and Eichenberg. Defensive tackle, Campbell, Gallimore, and Sealer. Outside linebacker, Chubb, Phillips, Barrett, and Robinson. Off-ball linebacker, David Long Jr., Jordan Brooks, Anthony Walker, Cornerbacks, Ramsey, Fuller, Smith, Kohu, Safeties, Holland, and Poyer. Specialists are Sanders, Bailey, and Ferguson. So that's 37. There's nine more probable guys that I think are going to make the roster unless they have some sort of catastrophic camp or preseason. So quarterback, that's Mike White. You know, they're, they're paying him the most dollars. He was the backup last year. It's been well noted to me that Skylar Thompson's still got problems with processing in camp environments. He's more of a gamer that doesn't really inspire too much confidence out of your third guy. 
So I think Mike White makes the roster as the second quarterback. And I think they probably only keep two on the active roster. And I'll explain why in a little bit. Running back, I think you're going to see a battle if you're going to have a fifth guy in that room between Chris Brooks and Jeff Wilson Jr. So we'll skip that for now. Receiver, I think Malik Washington is probably going to make it just based on his ability to play in the slot and his yards after catch ability. I think it gives you more explosiveness than Braylon Sanders, River Craycraft, Eric Azukama, that type of group. Uh, tight end, I think Julian Hill is probably more safe than people think, just given his prowess as a blocker. And then I don't think the Dolphins have shown a big proclivity to have like that tall, bendy, athletic tight end. You know, they didn't use Gesicki to great effect when he was here under McDaniel. We'll see with Jody Fortson. You know, not much tape, but the tape is good. Offensive line, I think Kendall Lamb is probably your front runner to be the swing tackle. I only listed him as probable because you never know with a player like Patrick Paul, it might click. And with the size and the traits that he has, maybe they they take a leap of faith there a little bit. It might be a little irresponsible given Toronto Armstead's injury history, but if you trust a player like that enough to take him in the second round, you're probably pretty confident in him. That being said, I know I do know and can share that during OTAs and mini camps, Teron Armstead didn't do any of the eleven on eleven stuff. The left tackle at every one of those practices was Kendall Lamb. Patrick Paul worked exclusively at left tackle with the twos. So there's that. I don't really have anyone else on the offensive line I would consider, you know, a probable. The defensive line, I have two, the D tackle room, Tier Tart and Benito Jones. The whole Tier Tart thing is kind of a mystery to me. I think it's a bit overblown. And I think this defense is kind of perfect for him to be able to reprise his role that he had in Tennessee when he was successful there. Uh, if you go back and watch the tape, David Long played really well off of Tier Tart in that system, especially in coverage. People kind of forget David Long was really good in coverage until the whole Fangio Van Ginkle love affair last year. So I think Tier Tart is probably more safe than people think. And then Benito Jones being the other, you know, he's really the only body type type of guy that they have with NFL experience, with NFL experience that has played sort of like a true blue, you know, zero to like two eye technique. And that's about all you can do. Outside linebackers, I put Mohamed Kamara as a probable just because I think he's probably your fourth guy if Bradley Chubb isn't ready at the start of the season. Cornerback, I didn't really have another. And then safety, I think Elijah Campbell and Marcus May make it. So that gets you to 46 guys. So you've got seven spots left. And these are sort of the positional battle. And again, I mean, this is sort of like the last spot on the roster. So I don't think they add another quarterback beyond Tua and Mike White. And we'll explain why in a minute in due time. At running back, I think Chris Brooks wins out that role. I think he gives you a skill set that really none of the other backs have. Like Jeff Wilson, is it really all that different than Raheem Mostert and what Jalen Wright offer you? You know, maybe he's more bruiser than slasher. But I think with Chris Brooks, you have more of a true big back. Not that Miami had much proclivity to use a big back last year. But I think he gives you that extra skill set, and he did a lot on special teams. If you recall, early in the year, Jeff Olson Jr. was often inactive, and Chris Brooks was active because he played on special teams till he got hurt. At receiver, I think River Craycraft is the sixth guy that makes it. I think just because of his blocking ability, his ability to play special teams, his knowledge of the offense, I believe he was in the top 50 last year in the entire NFL in yards per route per reception, I believe. Or yards per or yards per route run, something like that. Only caught like nine passes, but you know, he offers them a lot of security in terms of knowing what to do, blocking and all of that stuff. So I think he's probably going to be that sixth guy. 
for now at least, I would have Jody Fortson on the roster as just kind of more of a a red zone weapon. I think it's sort of an indirect battle, in my opinion, between him and like Eric Azukama in terms of what you can do. And I think Eric Azukama's biggest blocker was that the team went out and signed Odell Beckham to be like a an ex receiver who can operate out of the slot, who can win suddenly on a lot of short and quick routes you know mcdaniel talked about him being a third down guy i don't know that you trust eric azukama who's played a grand total of like two games in two years without a single reception as that guy so he's kind of blocked offensive tackle they've already got four and i kind of cheated here people forget when they talk about keon smith that he was brought in as an undrafted free agent in Brian Flores' his last year in 2021. So every single year, 21, 22, and 23, he's worked at guard in the preseason. You can even go back to last year in the preseason and watch him in the Texans game playing at left guard. I think at this point, we kind of know what Rob Jones is, and he's a serviceable player. I'm more intrigued with the athleticism that Keon Smith brings. And maybe now that you have Patrick Paul in the fold, there's more of an incentive to playing Keon Smith inside at guard and trying to develop him there. So I would lean more towards Keon Smith getting the ninth spot because I think if you let him hit the market, he's probably going to get scooped up just because there is that film on tape. Um, The defensive line, I know this one will kind of, you know, ruffle some feathers. I think Jonathan Harris, if they decide to keep six, and I'm doing it here, even though they had a five-man rotation in Baltimore pretty strictly, I think maybe you keep six guys and have one inactive on game day. I think Jonathan Harris has, you know, sort of, we'll call it body type analog with Campbell and Sealer. So you've got a similar player type there. And I think just watching some of his games with Denver, you can see, like, the potential, you know, I would say if you're putting like a ceiling on him, it's probably like what Kendall Langford was, who was a really nice player for what he was. You know, he was never going to be like a multi, you know, sack guy. He was just kind of a good, long, strong, run defending, like odd front D lineman. I think that's what Jonathan Harris can be. Um, Outside linebackers, there's really no one else. I would say if Phillips doesn't start the year on the active roster, sort of the next man up to me would be Quentin Bell, who actually got a lot of reps there um, in OTAs. Uh, Off-ball linebacker or just an additional linebacker, I'll give you the surprise name. It's Cam Brown over Duke Riley and Channing Tindall. Now maybe they you know go with one less tight end or – you know, something like that. I think Cam Brown was basically signed to be a specific special teams guy for Danny Crossman. So now you've got Cam Brown, you've got Elijah Campbell, and, you know, you can probably find another guy to be kind of your three core special teams guys on there. Uh, we'll just call it defensive back. Um, I think Nick Needham gets that last spot just be over Ethan Bonner because if I, and this is with the caveat, if Needham's healthy, I think he could push Cater Kohu for reps in the slot, whether that's a nickel or a dime job, depending on what they do with Cam Smith vis-a-vis Jalen Ramsey. And then I think Needham, and people forget this, he's been cross-trained as a safety since 2021. You go back to the home Jets game that year, Javon Holland had to sit out because of the COVID protocol. Nick Needham was the other starter at safety alongside Eric Rowe in that game. So he's done it before. I think his athleticism lends himself to it. But those are the last seven guys. Chris Brooks at running back, River Craycraft a receiver, Jody Fortson at tight end, Keon Smith as an, we'll just call him an O-lineman, Jonathan Harris as a D-tackle, Cam Brown as a linebacker, and then Nick Needham as a DB. So which leads me to the practice squad candidates. There's a new rule in the NFL this year, and this is what it relates to for Skylar Thompson. You can keep a practice squad quarterback and call him up 
every week of the entire season to be your third quarterback. You don't have to put him on the roster after three call-ups like you do at any other position. So essentially, I think a lot of teams would assign their third quarterback to be a practice squad guy who you call up on game day. That's where I think Skylar Thompson fits. I think if you can get him back, you know, Jeff Wilson Jr. on the practice squad makes some sense just because he knows the offense. It's break glass when an injury occurs. Just giving, you know, ample heads up with Mostert and A-Chan's histories. I think at receiver, there's three guys I would want to keep. Uh, Eric Azukama, if he'd stay. Braylon Sanders, you know, just because he kind of had that quad injury last year. Didn't really get a chance to compete in camp. But, you know, you're in a pretty thick name battle here. And then Taj Washington, the rookie who's on the PUP list already, is probably a guy that you want to try and develop. Deshaun Hand as a defensive tackle would be kind of the same as Jeff Wilson Jr. That's break glass if an injury happens. I think you would probably try and keep one of the two between Duke Riley and Shannon Tindall. And I, I kind of suspect maybe they would keep Channing Tyndall just because he's cheaper if he shows improvement on special teams so obviously that's not all of the practice squad spots but those are like the guys I would want to keep and you know and try and fight to get them to stay on the practice squad um you know looking at some of the undrafted free agents Miami has or other guys like a Brandon Pilly would probably be intriguing as a nose tackle like developmental option I think Matthew Jones, the lineman from Ohio State, and Ireland Brown from Rutgers would be intriguing options, especially both of them at the center position and not just at guard. I know they used Ireland Brown as a center in OTAs and minicamp. I don't think they used Matthew Jones there. Um, And then it's kind of take your pick with some of those DBs. Like Isaiah Johnson is probably the one that intrigues me the most at corner. But again... You know you're you're battling pretty uphill there, severely uphill, to try and make that spot. And I think, as we've kind of learned the last couple of years, you know it's not just your 53 man roster. You know, you're really kind of keeping like 58, 60 guys. You know, you want to have those guys on your practice squad that you can bring up when needed. And they've done some weird operational things in the past, like. 2022, you know, they put River Craycraft on the practice squad to start the year, then called him up. Last year, they had Cameron Good on the practice squad, called him up the first three games of the year because of injury, then signed him to the roster. You know, there's different mechanisms to do it. So I think now, especially that there's no limit on the number of service years a player has to be on the practice squad it makes sense to go out and try and tab some of those veterans to go out and and fill some of those roles, especially guys internal to your team that already know the system. So that's sort of my take on the 53-man roster for right now. I think if they're going to look anywhere else immediately, it's probably at guard, you know, someone like a Mark Lewinsky or Greg Van Roten. As, you know, multiple people have kind of detailed this off season. Whether you've listened to Chris Kaufman or Kyle Krabs or you know Big Mike on our own network, like that's kind of the one spot people think of. I still think you could use some more athleticism at safety, um, but the Marcus May addition makes a lot of sense. And quite frankly, if May stayed healthy, it wouldn't surprise me if he ended up out snapping Jordan Poyer. You know, as the season goes along. You know, game by game basis. So, you know, and I would say if there's any talented interior defensive line help that gets cut or becomes available for trade, that's something that the Dolphins still need to explore just because you're going to feel the sting of not having Christian Wilkins in a, in, a, in a big way that I think most people aren't prepared for. People keep talking about Zach Sealer. He's played next to Christian Wilkins every snap he's ever been on the field, just about. Like, you don't have that chemistry. You don't have that guy you can play off of like that. Now you're in the crosshairs, you know, much more so than you were in the past. So I'm very interested to see how this team and this defense start the season. 
I think the plus, the upshot here is of your first five games, all five teams have a brand new defensive coordinator. Four teams, every team but Buffalo, has a brand new coaching staff. You know, the new coordinator in Buffalo is essentially running the Sean McDermott defense, and McDermott called it last year. So I don't know how much that changes. But I think you you could very well be looking at games you have to win, like 31-27, 27-24, 38-35, you know, kind of like the, the Chargers game last year or the Lions game from 2022 where you, you know, your defense may not click very much but gets a key stop or a key turnover when you need it rather than being, you know, at times the dominant force that we saw last year and saw when Brian Flores was here um, and sometimes when Josh Boyer was there, but more so last year and with Flores at the helm. You know, I think you've got a a nice chance to kind of iron that out the first five games, get a bye, and then you can kind of dive into the meat of your schedule against more established teams just based on historic, you know, record and coaching staff patterns to compete against them once you kind of make your tweaks over the bye. So that's kind of the big stumbling block I see for the Dolphins coming out of the gate based on roster construction right now and in my predicted 53. Hit me up on Twitter at KevinMD4. Feel free to listen to the show anywhere you get your podcasts, Spotify, iTunes, Spreaker, Podbean. We're on all of those outlets, and that's going to do it for this week's show. Hopefully, we'll be back next week, Monday or Tuesday night, with Evan Morris recording with me. Until then, have a great rest of your week. We will see you next week when it's training camp in earnest. And this week's episode was brought to you by Caneswear. Caneswear is the place to go for officially licensed apparel for the Miami Dolphins, Miami Heat, the Miami Hurricanes, Florida Panthers, and all of the professional and college teams in South Florida. Looking for the latest jersey, a birthday gift, or the newest hat to hit the market for your favorite South Florida team? Check out Caneswear for their overwhelming selection of sports apparel. Located at 2655 South University Drive in Davie, Florida, Caneswear has it all. Not in South Florida? No worries. Just visit caneswear.com to shop their inventory from the comfort of your home, and they'll ship to you. International fans, too. Caneswear.com is the spot that Miami fans shop. That's Caneswear.com, Caneswear.com.